All right, so let's uh, talk about the counterculture. I'll have two video lectures on the counterculture. Uh, tune in, turn on, drop out. That was the motto of the counterculture. Tune in to the counterculture, turn on, smoke weed, take some acid, do whatever, and drop out. Of course, not just drop out of school, but drop out of society, form your own little clique. Now, there are going to be a couple adult situations and verbiage used in this, so please just uh, keep that in mind, I guess, as we go on. So now we get to the counterculture. Again, I want to talk a little bit about the background of the counterculture from where this comes. Um, we talked about voices of protest in the 1950s, and one of the more significant groups, I guess, not um, as far as impact on popular culture, but would the, be the beat poets or the beat generation. Um, this was a term coined by Jack Kerouac, uh, his famous work on the road, which was very much the core of the beat poets. If you've read it, I'm sorry. If you haven't, don't worry about it. <laughs> we'll get to a little bit here, but, um, according to Kerouac, this was meant to relay that they felt exhausted. They felt beat down by World War II. They felt the world is against me. And it is important to note that all of these beat poets, Allen Ginsberg, um, Jack Kerouac, um, there are many, which we'll touch upon, but they're all from well-to-do families. They were mostly educated in the Ivy Leagues, um, and they really, again, form the backbone, not just the foundation, but the backbone of the counterculture that we see in the 1960s. They were critical of Cold War paranoia. They were not a politically political group necessarily, but again, they were critical of Cold War paranoia. They were critical of racism, materialism, the sexual inhibitions of the decade. They were critical of the uniformity or the conformity, if you will, of the 1950s. Um, we see some early elements of environmentalism. There are calls for anarchy, which are of course, I always consider these ironic because usually the people calling for anarchy are the ones who require the help from the government the most. Anarchy, no government, no help. You get my point. Um, they were for peace. Uh, they were for proof of American progress, true American progress. They called for changes in art, for a general opening up. They celebrated African-American culture. Uh, for example, jazz music. Um, that's where you get you know, this uh, old image of the, you know, the hipster in the sunglasses at the jazz club snapping along to the music or snapping one's fingers as uh, a form of appreciation. Uh, this comes from the beat poets and their experiences there. They romanticized poverty, um, which would elicit some critiques from uh, those who actually were in poverty. Um, and this same thing with the counterculture, which we'll see, you know, in the 1960s. But again, so they celebrate African-American culture. They romanticize poverty. They wrote about the underground, the underworld. They wrote about drug subcultures, what they called the underside of America. Uh, most of their writing was stream of consciousness style. It was spontaneous. It was seemingly unedited. And for many of them, it was unedited. There was graphic sexuality. Much of this was homosexuality. There was a lot of use of alcohol and drugs, which again provides somewhat of a preview of the counterculture. Getting back to Kerouac and his work On the Road, um, the story was him on the road. It very much showed the carefree lifestyle of the Beats um, as Kerouac's character hitchhikes across the country. He enjoys many casual friendships. He enjoys various sexual relationships. Um, a non-materialistic lifestyle embraced by many at the time who were seeking something more. Uh, for Kerouac and the Beats, again, this is what it was about. It was about going out, enjoying life, not being tied to any materialistic realities, um, enjoying sex, enjoying drugs, um, I guess really getting your id on, if you will, or a lot of Dionysian pleasures being enjoyed. Um, so, again, Kerouac's work on the road is considered kind of the statement of the beats. There are impor other important works. Allen Ginsberg, his work Howl, which uh, was a long poem, assailed materialism and conformity. It called for the unleashing of basic human needs and desires. Uh, his poem America criticized materialism and war. Uh, Lawrence Ferenghetti would be another major writer. And, of course, William Burroughs. Uh, when I was in Lawrence, Kansas, he was still living there. He lived out on a lake. Uh, one of my professors often went out and hung out with him, and he said that there was nothing more exhilarating 
the going out, getting wasted with William Burroughs and having him shoot his gun. If you're familiar with William Burroughs and his background, um, which <laughs> in the William Tell Overture, he had uh, actually shot his second wife playing William Tell um, and then playing the overture over it. But playing William Tell with his second wife, shot her by accident, would end up moving to South America uh, where he rambled around for years. But again, this is, I wouldn't be around Burroughs and his gut. Two of his major works were Junkie and Naked Lunch. Um, one key to Burroughs was his methodology. He helped establish what was called the collage technique, a writing style that was different and a bit confusing. And again, it very much reflected a world, a life on drugs. So again, the beats very much lay the foundation for the counterculture. And what was the counterculture about? Of course, we have hippies. We have a lot of drugs, music. It starts out with folk music, turns into psychedelic music later. Um, Bob Dylan, The Times They Are Changing, which will be the second counterculture um, video lecture. And very much when he changes to the electric sound, it very much reflects many of the changes we see in the counterculture, in the civil rights movement, in popular culture, and even in the new left. Dylan very much um, led the charge. He led the changes in the movement, as well as reflected many things that were going on in the world. Now, there are other things we see here, of course, this change in the 1960s attitude. The 1950s was about conformity. The 1960s was about nonconformity. Think about Woodstock, uh, the New Left, the student movement, the SDS, the anti-war movement, which we'll get to in a separate uh, group of lectures. But the counterculture, again, when we get to hippies, we talk about mysticism. We talk about sexual exploration. We talk about drugs. Um, the Human Being, which was held January 14th, 1967, very much encapsulated the uh, counterculture. It was a get-together of leftists, of hippies, of beats. Um, it was about music. It was about drugs. It was about Eastern mysticism. Timothy Leary was president, the great promoter of LSD. This is where we get the term, tune in, turn on, drop out. Um, this is what he told everybody at The Human Being. If you're familiar uh, with Timothy Leary, you know that he uh, is a man of pretty uh, wild experiences. Um, he even makes an appearance in a Cheech and Chong movie, and no surprise, his appearance deals with acid and him promoting acid. Uh, Norman O. Brown was a hippie spokesman. Um, his books and ideas would help to clarify the hippie mindset, and again, this very much came together at The Human Being. Major themes included eternal bodily pleasure, again, Dionysian pleasures, um, that hippies were one with the world, that there was unity among all, there was no individualism, just one large collective. It was non-political. It focused on instinct, not rational thought, and last, pansexualism. So again, as many sexual experiences as you can take in, that's what they uh, promoted. And again, this was very much about Dionysian ecstasy through sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It was anti-authoritarian, but larger than the immediate authority, the movement eroded traditional liberal values by demeaning the ideas of the Protestant work ethic. Um, they uh, demean the idea of postponing one's uh, gratification. They called for immediate, inst in I'm sorry, <laughs> immediate gratification. Um, they also criticized things like hard work, self-denial. They thought these things were just bourgeois values that did not help people, uh, but rather uh, was part of authority keeping control. And they were about loosening the shackles of control. Their drugs of choice were, again, hallucinogens, uh, marijuana, which dated back to the 1950s, the beets, LSD or acid, which really came to the fore in the 1960s, was actually part of a larger government experiment. Again, Timothy Leary was at the uh, at the foundation of that. He was the one who did the studies um, before he tripped too many times and just started having a lot of fun. Mushrooms would be a third hallucinogen that many of them focused on. Um, there was a commune called Millbrook. Now, this was theoretically a religious commune, but it was all about everybody being on drugs, on sharing sexuality. Again, it was about being a hippie and sharing this with everybody else. You have Ken Kesey and his Merry Pranksters. Now, who's Ken Kesey? He was an author. He was a beat. Uh, his book would actually, one of his books actually uh, was the foundation for the movie One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. He went from being a beat to being a hippie. 
Um, again, he very much reflects this kind of transition we see from beats to hippies, from beats to counterculture. He performed what he and his cohorts called the electric Kool-Aid acid test. Uh, so there was a concert. They gave people acid uh, at concerts when they came in, and then they watched how they reacted. Um, this included not just how they reacted to the music, but fantastic light shows. This is another thing you see with the counterculture with music from the 1960s. Um, music, of course, is the, is the key to it, but they also include these amazing light shows to uh, really, I guess, enhance one's trip, if you will. Um, so there are many visuals for these trippers to participate in. And again, what Kesey and his pranksters did was they uh, watched people. They reacted. They studied. What were they doing? How does this affect people? Of course, they were on it themselves. Uh, continuing, I had mentioned we see uh, as the decade wears on, we get into more psychedelic music. We get into acid rock bands like The Grateful Dead, Jefferson Airplane, their song White Rabbit, the San Francisco sound as a whole. White Rabbit very much, I think, is one of the top five songs of the 1960s. Not because it's a great song, but because, again, it reflects the drug culture. If you listen to the song, it's way out there. It is psychedelic. There is no linear sense to the song. Um, and that very much reflected, again, the San Francisco sound, the emphasis on drugs, etc. Another band, Big Brother and the Holding Company. Now, just think about the name. Big Brother and the Holding Company. This, of course, was led by Janis Joplin, who also had a preoccupation with sex and drugs. Uh, one time she was asked about a vacation she had taken down on St. Thomas. She replied simply, quote, it was just like anywhere else. I fucked a lot of strangers, end quote. She would die a year later of a heroin overdose. Um, the Beatles, of course, a major band from the 60s. Um, somewhat similar evolution to Dylan. They go from kind of these somewhat simple pop songs of the early 1960s to more artistic psychedelia, for example, with Sgt. Pepper's um, and the album The Beatles, which is commonly known as the White Album. In many ways, this reflected American culture as well, from generic pop, bubblegum popular culture in the 1950s to the psychedelia to the turning on, the tuning in, and the dropping out. And the Beatles would very much reflect, again, these changes um, to drug culture, um, to a sense of mysticism. If you're familiar with the Beatles, you know this is all over their music. There's one other important American band. Um, the Beatles, obviously, are British. There's another important American band, though, that's worthy of mention. And if you look back, you can see Smile, the Beach Boys. Um, the Beach Boys, their work Pet Sounds, uh, was a completely different album from anything that the Beatles or Bob Dylan were doing at the time. It was highly influential when Pet Sounds came out. Um, it, the, the notion is that Lennon and McCartney were somewhat depressed because it was the greatest album they'd ever heard. It influenced them to make Revolver uh, and then even into Sgt. Pepper's. Brian Wilson, of course, is the leader of the Beach Boys Um if you haven't heard Pet Sounds, it's an amazing album. It is very mellow. It is poppy. Um, it is not psychedelic. It is, does not challenge the establishment in any way, but it is the perfect album. Later, he would get into, when he did Smile, that is when he would start to get into pot and acid. And um, the original version of Smile, again, an incredible record. Um, his bandmates who were not into the drugs did not like it. They turned him down and pretty much ruined him. Um, but those are kind of the three big, I guess, uh, artists, if you will, Bob Dylan, the Beatles, and the Beach Boys, and each significantly different. Uh, okay, so I mentioned the San Francisco sound with the dead and the airplane um, with Joplin. We also have Hate Ashbury, H-A-I-G-H-T. Um, Hate Ashbury, of course, is the corner, uh, the famous corner in San Francisco, Cisco, which would become known as the capital of the hippie world. It was here that you had things like the free store. Um, folks like the diggers had actually um, opened up this free store. It was a store where everything was literally free. Some people would try to steal. Um, they would be stopped by those who worked there uh, who would tell them, you don't need to steal this. It's free. <laughs> um, this also provided space for runaways to stay. Um, they also would distribute free food on Ashbury Street. The diggers did. Um, they're very much at the core of the 60s, the mid-60s San Francisco lifestyle. Um, one other thing that's kind of fun, when liberals would give them money because they wanted to support these groups, they would actually burn the money. Uh, obviously, this was part symbolic. 
I'm sure that a few people took money here and there. Now, the hippies, the counterculture, in many ways, tried to emulate the lifestyle of Native Americans. Um, again, getting to mysticism, getting to the past. They eat, idealized them for their mysticism, for their unity with nature, for their concept of a tribe. Um, Native Americans didn't see it this way necessarily. One tribal spokesman was asked to have a bee-in in Grand Canyon um, uh, with the assistance of him and his other Hopi leaders. This Indian, I'm sorry, this tribal spokesman responded to these hippies by saying, no, because you mean well, but you are foolish. You are a tribe of strangers to yourselves. Words of wisdom. And indeed, they weren't a tribe. They were many different tribes or types of people. There were capitalists among the crowd who took advantage of the scene to fill their coffers. There were radicals. There were anarchists. There were violent offenders. There were true hippies. One example of the barrenness of their mor morality uh, on the streets of San Francisco, a 16-year-old girl was shot full of speed and then raffled off to strangers. Now, what leads to the fall of the counterculture? And then I'm going to offer you an idea of one example of uh, a thought as far as the end of the 1960s. As far as the fall of the counterculture, we have official repression. Now, police began to rough up hippies. Health officials harassed the communes. Narcotics agents infiltrated the neighborhoods. After all, what city leaders want their city to be known as a den of sin? And even in ultra-liberal San Francisco, this would come to fruition. There was African-American hostility. Um, hippies lost a potential ally for change. Um, hoods from nearby Fillmore would cruise the streets, threatening rape and violence. Blacks did not like white kids trying to act poor, again, romanticizing the idea of poverty and true struggle, nor the fact that Haight-Ashbury was essentially all white. One beatnik said that Haight-Ashbury was, quote, the first segregated bohemia I've ever seen. So there is black hostility primarily because there is no real reaching out from these rich white kids. There is media hype, almost like marketing for the bad seeds of society. A growing population of unstable, psychotic, and criminal folks moved to the area of San Francisco. This led to an increase in crime very rapidly, leading many to stay inside or, for some, to just simply leave. Um, there was an absorption into popular culture. For some, the hippies represented something cool. Hey, let's bring it into the mainstream. You very much see this with many subcultures, with many countercultures in history. Um, I, for one, can tell you when I first attended uh, undergraduate school, college in the late 80s, one of the fascinations was hippie culture, people dressing and acting like it. And these were not all rebels. These were very many people who were ensconced in doing what the mainstream was doing. I would often joke with them, if you're wearing bell bottoms now, you don't remember how ugly bell bottoms were in the 70s. But that's for another time. A few other reasons, again, absorption into popular culture makes sense. Economic recession. Um, this led to the realization that affluence could not be assumed that caution would be recommended. Uh, again, many of these kids, just like the Beats, were rich kids. Um, they were bored with their lives. They didn't want to go to college. They wanted sex, drugs, and rock and roll. So they found a way to find sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Often this was on their parents' dime. And when that money ran out, they had to go home. They had to go to college. They had to suddenly get with it. There was no more dropping out, if you will. No more tuning in, turning on, and dropping out. So an economic recession contributed to this. We also see, with some, a shift to true radicalism, um, away from the rhetoric of love toward politics of rage. This is particularly noticeable in the late 60s when there is increasing anger. Um, and when we talk about the new left, we'll get into the weathermen, we'll get into some of these violent acts. And for some of them, again, this idea of love and drugs was great for a while, but they wanted change, and so they would shift to being true radicals. Woodstock very much was the crescendo of the movement. Um, you're likely familiar with Woodstock, of course, a few days in upstate New York uh, with music aplenty, drugs aplenty, nakedness aplenty, mud aplenty. It's a fascinating story, really. Um, but again, very much this was the... Um, it was really the crescendo of the counterculture. One of the ways, though, um, I would say the death of the counterculture and arguably the end of the 1960s would come at Altamont. The Rolling Stones uh, had a 
fabulous tour in 1969. They hit all over the world, and they wanted to end this tour in uh, California at Altamont uh, with a free show. Now, many bands were playing free shows. This was kind of becoming the rage. So the Stones wanted to jump in on this. And much like many other bands, they hired Hell's Angels to guard the stage. Um, this was particularly prevalent in California at this time. Um, they had done this before, but again, this was, uh, again, kind of the norm for many bands. Um, the Hell's Angels, though, when they show up, they armed themselves with sawed-off pool cues. Many of them were high on bad dope. Many in the crowd actually were on bad dope and bad acid. Um, and this really affected many um, and it can lead to, again, unintended consequences with this. Numerous fights would break out at this concert, and the angels would end up indiscriminately attacking people, um, some who were involved in fights, some who were not. One example, Jefferson Airplane, I had mentioned earlier, and they, they were a huge band in the 60s. Again, they very much reflected the San Francisco sound and San Francisco culture. Um, they were one of the opening bands. A fight broke out near the stage during their set. Um, the Hells Angels were beating someone badly. Marty Balin, who was one of the band members, went to try to stop the fight. A Hells Angel knocked him out cold, and that was the end of the airplane set. The Grateful Dead were supposed to follow them. They decided not to even appear because of all this violence, and they would leave. The Stones would finally come on after leaving the crowd in the cold and rain for many hours. They started with the song Street Fighting Man. Now, Great song. If you're familiar with the Stones, they had a run of amazing records in the late 60s into the early 70s. And then you get into things like Tattoo You. But hey, that's, again, for a different discussion. I'm not a lot of bad music over there. There's some good stuff. But their highlight, again, you get to Exile on Main Street, um, Let It Bleed, uh, Beggar's Banquet. Those were amazing records. Anyway, Street Fight Man was one from one of those records. Great rocking song, but this very much foreshadowed what was going to happen that night. Not only, again, of that night, but really of the movement altogether, one could argue. As the Stones would play Sympathy for the Devil later in the show, a fan, uh, well, a Hells Angel member killed one of the fans, um, stabbed him. And this was actually caught live on video. They were recording a concert, uh, a video recording of the concert to be released in movie theaters. So while they're filming, they actually see the Hells Angel stab this fan. And then you see an ambulance roll up. The fan and his girlfriend leave. Um, she is hysterical. He ends up, again, dying. Uh, you can actually look on YouTube. Maybe I'll share this. But the Stones would actually watch... Part of the film they would watch this happen and they actually left it in the final cut of the film now this is the loss of any possible innocence the movement could have claimed um again you know one of the questions i often ask about the 1960s when did it begin when did it end obvious answer 1960 to 1969 but it's not that simple it's much more complex uh, i think one legitimate argument is watergate uh, that really ended the hope of a country in many ways. One can also look at Altamont, especially when you look at the counterculture. This was really the end of the counterculture. This was the end of hope. You have music, you have drugs, you have um, sex going on, but somebody is murdered needlessly, um, which really tamped down uh, kind of the ecstasy that was supposed to come with the concert. Um, with the upbeat nature of the Stones and their tour itself. So, uh, okay, well, that is it for part one. We will get to part two, bringing it all back home when we discuss Bob Dylan. Don't be afraid, just because his voice wouldn't make it on The Voice or on America's Got Talent, um, he is America's greatest songwriter.